welcome to Examining the Psychedelic Renaissance Season 2. My name is Shannon Smadella and I'm your host for the series. We are now in the last episode or season finale of Season 2 of our web series. Can you guys believe it? Over the past 10 months, we've had the chance to hear from some of the most notable in the field of psychedelic research over 30 episodes and almost 50 speakers. Each of these speakers and panels have shown up to share important information and their take on the psychedelic renaissance. I have to say it's been a pleasure being your host and speaking with all of these 50 amazing researchers, scientists, doctors, shamans, visionaries, and experts. As you know, the funds raised from examining the psychedelic renaissance go to support MAPS Canada and their efforts in conducting studies to develop psychedelics into safe and legal medical treatments. MAPS Canada, as most psych psychedelic organizations do, relies on public donations and fundraising initiatives. The funds raised from this webinar series will go to fund this research. So thank you for being here because your investment makes a difference. To view the different studies that MAPS is currently working on, please see full details at mapscanada.org and maps.org. A special thank you again to all of our sponsors that have stepped up and our volunteers that have made a difference behind the series. So we are looking at potentially hosting a series three, but before we start planning, we'd love your opinion on series two. If you don't take mind taking a minute after the webinar today to fill out the form, which will be posted in the chat, we would be greatly appreciative of that. So some housekeeping items before we bring on our series finale guest, Paul Stamets. Just a note to type your questions in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen. As a reminder, you can vote up your questions as we will be prioritizing those. And then also let us know where you're tuning in from in the chat today. We have people from all over the world here. It looks like we have Croatia, we have Matthews, we have Oregon, Florida, Chicago, Ontario, we have Portland, we have Vancouver, Minnesota, Victoria, Colorado, we have Ottawa, St. John's, Newfoundland, BC Coast, more from Newfoundland, Oakville, Ontario, Whistler, California, Toronto, Arizona, Massachusetts, Salt Spring Island, all over the world. Paul, you're bringing them in from uh, all over the world. So without any further ado, let me introduce you. And this man really needs no introduction. Paul Stamets. Paul Stamets is a speaker, author, mycologist, medical researcher, and entrepreneur. Is considered an intellectual and industry leader in fungi, habitat, medicinal use, and production. His lectures extensive extends he lectures extensively to deepen the understanding and respect for the organisms that literally exist under every footstep taken on this path of life. Paul is the author of six books, including Mycelium Running, How Mushrooms Can Help Save the World, Growing Gourmet and Medicinal Mushrooms, and Psilocybin Mushrooms of the World. He has discovered and named numerous new species of psilocybin mushrooms. Paul has been awarded more than 40 patents with several patent applications in queue for unexpected activity of psilocybin analogs stacked with other substances. He has received numerous awards, including Invention Ambassador 2014-15 for the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, the National Mycologist Award in 2014 from the North American Mycological Association, and the Gordon and Tina Wasson Award 2015 from the Mycological Society of America. His work has entered into the mainstream of popular culture in the new Star Trek Discovery series on CBS. The science officer is portrayed by an astromycologist, a Lieutenant Paul Stamets. Paul's work with mycelium is a central theme of this series, and maybe we can ask him about that today. So today, Paul is going to talk about psilocybin mushrooms versus psilocybin, the dialectic between nature versus synthetic. Paul will discuss the history and advances in our understanding of psilocybin mushrooms. He will make the case for the therapeutic benefits of psilocybin mushrooms, which afford the benefits to the greatest number of people in need. 
in these COVID times, the need for antidepressants and anti-anxiety medicines is of paramount importance and serves a societal need currently not being addressed by conventional medicine. So please help me welcome Paul Stamets. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I'm honored to be here again, and thank you so much, Shannon. And um, so I'm I'm in Washington State. I live out in, in the country, uh, with a surrounded by a lot of forests. I've been here for since 1980, 1982 or so, and I have spent a long time all my life it seems studying mushrooms and i particularly got into mushrooms when i was quite young when my brother john came back from adventures in mexico and south america with these extraordinary stories of taking soul side mushrooms and i was the youngest in my family a family of five we had a large house and in the basement of the house there was a complete laboratory and my brother john was a serious scientist i was the youngest brother and the youngest of the family. So he wouldn't let me play in the laboratory, but I could sit there with him. And he, we had three rows of, of, uh, of, of chemicals and microscopes. And, and amazingly, we had the USS Intrepid aircraft radio, which my dad served on the Intrepid aircraft carrier during World War II. And upon um, the conclusion of World War II, he was able to grab the radio. So we had that in the basement. So I listened to the coded messages across the Iron Curtain. And I was put on a kind of stool there. My brother John would let me, you know, you know, hang out. But he went on to Yale. And my other brother Bill, he was very much into science. He went on to Cornell. And my sister Lily went on to Ohio State. And so after they left the house, the laboratory was there for my twin brother and I. Uh, with no supervision. <laughs> so we looked up every experiment that said danger to not bring near flame um, and nearly blew up the house a few times. I'm very lucky to be alive because um, we were dangerous. Um, but nevertheless, that was my dream and an impression to live in the country to have a laboratory complex, which I have now. And so I'm living my dream in many ways. My brother John died from cardiac arrest, unfortunately. He was a the strongest uh, influence on my life, um, an intellectual giant. And then he moved out from his was to Seattle with his Yale friends. They went to University of Washington Medical School. Um, he became a neurophysiologist. Um, and they rented a house, and I was a logger hippie for a few years up in the Cascades. So they were in the city, so they would come up to the Cascades, and we would hunt mushrooms, and I got really highly focused on psilocybin mushrooms. My brother John didn't have time to study those, but he was interested in neurophysiology and consciousness. And so my brother John at that point when I was living in Ohio, he lent me a book called Altered States of Consciousness. And it was a textbook and he said he needed to have it back soon. And then in two weeks, he's going back to Yale, it's one of his textbooks. And so I dove into it and was really excited about it. And um, I lent it to my, best friend Ryan and Ryan had the book and and um, I asked the Ryan in a few days hey how's the book you know can I get it back soon and he said sure sure and then a week or two passed and the, my brother John's asking me for the book and I couldn't get the book back and I kept on asking Ryan Ryan I need that book now Ryan had a very authoritarian father who did not like my family or us we were kind of the liberal intellectual ones and so finally I asked Ryan, I said, listen, I got to get my, this book back from my, my brother's asking for it. And um, Ryan then sheepishly told me, I, I can't give you back the book. My father burned it. Whoa. So that moment I realized was a pivotal moment in my life. If that book had information in it that was so disturbing that an authoritarian figure was afraid of it, afraid of his son becoming corrupted by exploring altered states of consciousness, then I definitely knew the subject that I want to get into. So I owe a debt of gratitude to Ryan's father, as well as to my brother, who was not very happy about my irresponsibility in lending his book out. But nevertheless, um, John and I were close buddies. We tripped on mushrooms and LSD numerous times. We came up with the phrase, uh, the family that trips together stays together. That's not always true, by the way, but we thought it was. Anyhow, I'm gonna delve into the history of psilocybin mushrooms and take you to the current state of knowledge as best as I can describe. I am one person in a long lineage of experts, 
as many of you are. We are here in this form, in this body, with these voices, and we're a continuation of knowledge that has existed for thousands, tens of thousands, perhaps millions of years. And these threads of knowledge have become frayed, and they've broken. And because of disease, because of um, religion, because of conquest of foreigners coming into indigenous lands, you know, there's um, it's been very much disrupted. The fact that we have any knowledge about the history of psilocybin mushrooms is really quite unique. And I think it speaks to a much larger narrative that there's a huge amount of information and history of the use of these mushrooms that we are, we don't know about, but we have a sense of that. So I'm gonna go ahead and activate my slideshow here if I can. Um, and this might be a little bit more challenging because my icon, oh, there we go. I, application window, yeah, roger that. Ah, sacre bleu. Is that French? I think it is, okay. There we go. Okay, psilocybin mushrooms versus psilocybin, the dialectic nature versus the synthetic. So um, thank you again, Maps Canada, uh, Shannon and uh, Mark Hayden, and thank you for being such great people and, and so brave in uh, moving the science forward uh, into the realm of academia and also of, of evidence-based medicine at a time critical, I think, that these substances can have an enormous societal benefit. So mushrooms, you know, come from mycelium, ultimately from spores. Two spores come together. If they're compatible, and they sexually mate. The downstream mycelium is called dicaryotic and binucleate. It's fully capable then of, of producing mushrooms. Um, and then the mushrooms uh, very quickly enlarge. And the mycelium can be in the ground for months, years. And the mushrooms come up in a matter of four or five days and they rot. So the mushrooms themselves really don't have a good immune system. They're nutrient dense. They're packed full, in this case, in many species with psilocybin. And oftentimes the mycelium is not, not always. There's, a, there's, there's some of the psilocybin mushroom species, the psilocybin is in the mycelium, other ones, they are not. Um, so, and the mushrooms form very uh, quickly. Now that the photograph on the left is extraordinary fruiting of Psilocybe cubensis. If you look at the ratio of the, the size of the fruit bodies from the substrate that it came from, and that, and that is not just an isolated little island. Uh, that was the entire substrate produced mushrooms of that quantity versus the substrate. So this is, you know, and they, you can see the slight bluing reaction that's associated with psilocybin and psilocin as it then uh, degrades. And the bluing reaction is indicative in many cases of psilocybin mushrooms. So I have numerous books out. And one of the general rules are if a mushroom has a purple brown to black spore print, and it's a gilled mushroom, and it bruises bluish. It, is, it has an over 90%, 95% probability it's a psilocybin-containing mushroom. They have to be together. Purple brown to black spore print of a gilled mushroom bruising bluish. Um, now, not also much psilocybin mushrooms bruise bluish, but many of them do. Uh, given that there are poisonous mushroom species out there, you must be careful. So please get a good field guide, go out with somebody that, that that knows these species. We follow these adages, when in doubt, throw it out. Uh, so, um, you know, be extremely careful if you're collecting uh, psilocybin mushrooms or trying to in the wild. So I often wondered how long does our history of the use of mushrooms go back? And so I was looking at, at, at primatology uh, textbooks and I was astonished to find that the Golgi monkey consumes up to 35% of its diet uh, is fungi, consuming more than 12 times its body weight. Now we in America, in the United States, or is, we consume about two kilograms of mushrooms per year, less than 3% of our average body weight. So it's an extraordinary consumption. So I was wondering, well, this is interesting that these, these small monkeys are consuming all these fungi. And then I examined it further, and it turns out that 22 primates, 23 adding humans, uh, consume fungi. Well, that really suggests to me that the lineage of the knowledge of consuming fungi by primates uh, must go back a very, very long time. So we look back to more than 2 million years ago to 200,000 years ago, 
Homo sapiens appeared around 200,000 years ago. Some, some people say as far back as 500,000 years ago. We evolved from Homo erectus. Uh, there's two big migrations. Homo erectus went into Europe first from Africa. We are all Africans, you know, genetically. Let's be very clear about that. We all came from Africa. Um, but the successful migration of the Homo sapiens was about 50,000 years ago. Within 50, 000, within 4,000 years of contact with Homo erectus and then Neanderthals, within 4,000 years of contact with Neanderthals, they became extinct. So we actually outcompeted these other primates in our habitats. So that also occurred during a time of climate change. And the ability of, of Homo sapiens to adapt to climate change it probably gave us a competitive advantage over some of our um, primate um, cousins, so to speak. Well, I think that's interesting as well. So there is, this is a short little video, Louis Schwartzberg, my friend, uh, some CGI put this together. And this speaks to the stoned ape hypothesis is what I call it. And Terrence and Dennis McKenna popularized this. Apes came out of the savanna. They're going across the savanna tracking animals. They'd find dung, they'd find mushrooms. They're hungry, they look edible, they consume them, they'd share them with their family. And then 20 minutes later, you have liftoff. And they're just catapulted into this extraordinary state of heightened consciousness. Uh, everything looks different. Fractals, mathematical patterns. And now we know clearly there's a neurogenic benefit. Psilocybin mushrooms increases neurons outgrowth, neurite outgrowth in particular. And so the sudden change of the, of the primate skull uh, to accommodate the increasing large brain cavity of Homo sapiens um, is, as occurs at this time in a relatively short period, uh, in some, some estimates less than 200,000 years. Now that's extraordinarily fa fast from an evolutionary point of view. How did that happen? Well, we may not ever be able to prove this. Um, I had a lot of fun making fun of Terence McKenna on the stoned ape theory, as he called it, in Dennis. Uh, but now I'm, I'm not so quick to make fun of them uh, on this issue. Look at the size of Slossopy uh, uh, acubensis coming out of elephant dung. Um, it's a very noticeable. Uh, so how often would these primate ancestors of ours encounter Slossopy cubensis in the savannas of, of, of Africa? Well, not a dozen times, not a hundred times, but millions upon millions of times over potentially millions of years. So because of the epigenetic influence of its re-stimulated contact, uh, I think this hypothesis or theory that they presented um, should be given more serious consideration. So Terence called it a stoned ape theory. I totally disagree with him on that. I think it's a hypothesis. Um, and psilocybin degrades into psilocin, and tightly about binds to activate serotonin receptors, um, 5 uh, HC2A in particular, stimulating neurogenesis, improving visual acuity and hearing. It's not a theory, it's a hypothesis. It's an educated guess to explain an observable phenomenon. The theory is a hypothesis that has been tested by science and factually supported. How are we going to prove that, that Homo sapiens brain enlarged from psilocybin mushrooms? We don't have the experimental, you know, time theater here to be able to conduct that experiment. Or perhaps we're developing that now. So I'm going to progress now to 7,000 years ago before present. And this is the first image you'll see is the actual pictograph from Northern Algeria. Um, and then the second one has been redrawn by my friend, Jonathan Meter. Um, and this is of the bee man. Now, that was 7,000 years ago, and the association of mushrooms and bees, you know, has been a long-held history, uh, not only in Mesoamerica, but also, also elsewhere in Europe. Uh, so mushrooms rot so quickly by putting them in honey because they have antimicrobial properties and a high sugar content. It would help them be preserved. Moreover, they'd be extracted and infused into the honey. Well, that was interesting to me because the Bavarian Beer Purity Act of 1516 was put into place called the Reinheit uh, Gebot. I am sure I mispronounced that. Um, and mushrooms specifically were banned from beer in 1516 from the Bavarian Beer Purity Act. 
Now, I think that's extraordinary because that's also the time that Christianity was actively uh, subjugating the indigenous religions of Europe, where Germanic uh, pagan peoples would go into the forest for coupling rites, for celebration of harvest, and imbibing in these psychoactive meads. So honey with mushrooms, with yeast, and making meads or beer. So I think it's highly probable, um, and, and as specifically mushrooms are mentioned, um, mushrooms were banned from beer, I think, as an exercise by the dominant uh, Christians to be able to subjugate uh, the indigenous pagan uh, people's uh, religious beliefs. Now, again, that's speculative, that's controversial. If anybody has uh, evidence to this effect, I would like to hear more of it. So there's those two pictographs, the original one, and as you can see, quite true to form. Uh, Kathleen Harrison also did a depiction of this in Terence and Dennis's uh, book, Austin Eric, The Soul Side of Ma Magic Mushroom and Grover's Guide. Also in that uh, labyrinthine cave complex, is these interesting characters. You can see they're running, spores of the mushrooms perhaps, or, or ideas are going to their heads. Um, this is an amazing thing about artists is that before the written word, these pictographs were a language of communication through the ages. And how would you express your, you, that you're getting knowledge and wisdom from mushrooms? And I said, so I think this, the artists are the fact that both of these occurred in the same cave complex and the b-man figure i think there's five or six of those figures uh at different sizes uh, that occur in in those caves so we advance forward to about 400 years bce um and this is the when um, um demeter is giving persephone uh, her daughter some mushrooms before she takes them and goes into the underworld and goes to sleep. That's the Greek mythology, the onset of winter. And then upon, you know, from being in Haiti, she comes back. That's the return uh, of her to the overworld, from the underworld, from the underground. And the seasonal um, myths of the religions then were then uh, described using this myth. So it's very clearly that she is giving uh, Persephone a mushroom. The Mesoamerican mushroom stones uh, from about 2700 BP before present to 1500 years ago. Um, uh, these Mesoamerican mushroom stones were about 200 of them exist around the world. And they are also are, are very mysterious, They're very difficult for us to ascertain their exact use and their as the, what symbolically they represented. Um, but the peoples of that area called them mushroom stones, even today in Guatemala, the Pacific Slope. And so there seems to be a heritage of language associated with these, mush these, these stone figures being intimately associated with mushrooms. I suspect they might look at the coat of arms. A lot of those regions are dependent upon water catchment from rain. So it could be a good place to symbolically invoke the rains to come. Um, again, we don't know. But oftentimes, shamanistically, figures and, and um, emblems um, and things that are shamanically important have a multiplicity of uses where it converges in the symbology. So, of course, it's phallic is one interpretation. Mushrooms are another in interpretation. Uh, invoking rain, perhaps your family coat of arms, maybe marking, it, marking a mushroom field. Again, highly speculative. We don't know. I am the temporary custodian of about 27 of these mushroom stones now that I've collected all my life that have been given to me uh, by private collectors. Many of them came from Guatemala in the 1970s. I have provenance on a few of them. It is my destiny uh, and my purpose to return these uh, to the Mayan people of Guatemala once I can find a, a custodian for them that can protect them. Um, that's a difficult subject, folks. I've been told by very much people who are knowledgeable about these mushroom stones that they're best in my possession currently, temporarily, but I'm dedicated to returning these uh, to the Guatemalan and Mayan people, the Mayan people, not the Guatemalan people, um, if there is a proper place that they can be protected and shared. 
So, but this is every morning. This is what I walk past when I wake up. And this is what I walk past when I go to bed. And so I feel like there's a village of ancestors that are there for me and encouraging me on my path. And I have such a tiny bit of knowledge compared to the resident knowledge. I think that's represented emblematically by these mushroom stones. So I just put this together just before the slideshow because I thought it was important. Uh, there's a long association with mushrooms and honey that I mentioned. Mushrooms, honey, and chocolate also goes back to Aztec times. And this is, you know, take a second to read this. This is from uh, a, a Franciscan priest by the name of uh, Bernardino de Sagun from 1529, came over with the Spanish conquest. These they ate before dawn with honey. They also drank cacao before dawn. The mushrooms they ate with honey, when they began to get heated from them, they began to dance and some sang and some wept. Some cared not to sing, but would sit down in their rooms and stay there pensive-like. Then when the drunkenness of the mushrooms had passed, they spoke with one another about the visions that they had seen. And he recorded uh, these, uh, you know, from ar artists at the time, the, and the upper one there is taxonomically correct. For those of you who are taxonomists on psilocybin mushrooms, uh, those three psilocybes being held in that figure's hands are accurate taxonomically. And the ones in the center there um, is a different species. There's multiple species that grow in, in this region. So uh, very, very interesting. And this, this has come, uh, comes R. Gordon Wasson and Roger M., uh, wrote a book called Les Champagnes Lucien du Mexique. And this is uh, some of the images from that book. We advanced to um, Life Magazine, 1955, 1957, May 13th. Millions of Americans received a field guide to psilocybin mushrooms on the doorstep, uh, right in the middle of the Cold War. And this, I think, was one of the pivotal moments in history that suddenly awoken Westerners in particular to the psilocybin mushrooms in the new world. And this also then spurred a tremendous migration of uh, mostly young people to Mexico in search of Maria Sabina and others that could teach them and share with them their experiences with magic mushrooms. So I was, um, hey Pam, I, I lost track of my time. If you could, so thanks. So um, Dr. Michael Bug, um, Dr. Uh, Daniel Stunts and uh, DeBlo, and then um, Dr. Alexander Smith, and then Kit Skates were four of my teachers. I like to always give them credit if I, um, because they were ones that took me under their wing when I was very young, and this is what I looked like. <laughs> so, anyhow. Um, so they kind of extraordinary because I was that's my first cook of Psilocybe Cubensis in the kitchen with my little all-American pressure cooker. And um, so I was treated like a leper, frankly. I go to conferences, no one would want to talk to me. I felt like I had this force field. I walk into a crowd and people would be distantly uh, uh, from me just because they wanted to, they would be too close to the, to the hippie. Um, but my interest was sincere. And Alex uh, uh, Smith and Daniel Stunts and Kit uh, and Michael Bug took a liking to me. And the three, these three have passed away. Michael Bug is still alive and well. And he has a new book coming out that's extraordinary on the Columbia River Basin mushrooms of the, of the Cascadia region. So uh, stay tuned for that. So Michael Bug sponsored three of us students, Jonathan Ott, Jeremy Bigwood, and myself. Uh, Jonathan Ott is an intellectual genius uh, of high order, and, and he was also a, a so closely associated with R. Gordon Wasson and Albert Hofmann. Many of you know of him. He's written about a dozen books. Jeremy Bo Bigwood was the one who did the photography for the Austin Eric Psilocybin Magic Mushroom Grower's Guide, and then myself. Between the three of us, I think we have 17 or 18 books out. So extraordinary that for this one professor, and Michael Bug was a chemist, and he was called in specifically to challenge legal authorities who are prosecuting mostly kids, young people for collecting psilocybin mushrooms, but using a flawed analytical technique. 
Michael was the expert witness by defense attorneys that often used. And then he rewrote the analytical methods, published it, and then he applied for a DEA license. And then we were all covered by a DEA license, which we had for about 10 years. And uh, so all the research I did at the Evergreen State College was fully um, legally protected. And that's when I quickly came up with a phrase that nature provides, I don't, because I, um, I say that for lots of reasons, but in particular, I'm very sensitive to the fact that these are powerful medicines. And if I give psilocybin mushrooms to somebody, I'm responsible partially for their experience. And I'm just not equipped for that. I'm not a therapist. Um, people have life-changing issues that they need to reconcile. And, and this is not my job. I'm a, I'm a taxonomist. I'm a mycologist. Uh, I'm not a physician. I'm not a psychotherapist. So for very good reasons, um, you know, besides all the other reasons that are obvious, it, I've been self-disciplined and not providing psilocybin mushroom to other people. So we had a great psilocybin mushroom species expedition in 19, 1977. There was that Gaston Guzman wrote the world monograph on psilocybin, Gary Menser, Stephen Pollock, uh, myself and Dale Leslie. We started doing a series of mushroom conferences, um, started in, in 1977 and they progressed all the way to um, 1999. So we have a long history of putting these psych psychoactive mushroom conferences together. There's Jonathan Ott on the far right, uh, Stephen Pollock on the far left, and myself in the center, Gaston, Guzman, et cetera. And so these conferences you know, were really cutting edge because the taxonomy was something that was not clear. Many new species were discovered in the Northwest. So the migration from Mexico to Mexico kind of slowed when people realized they grew in wood chips in the fields, also in the Pacific Northwest of, of Oregon, Washington State, and, and in Western British Columbia, primarily. So we, we persisted with these mushroom conferences and, and uh, for 40 years, I put together the Millennia Mushroom Conference in 1999. Uh, I'm officially a Mary Prankster. And then Ken Kesey and the Mary Pranksters are, you know, I have a long history with them. And I knew Alex, uh, Alexander Shulgin, there's Shulgin, there's An Andrew Weil, uh, you know, Gary Linkoff, David Aurora. And I realized I knew these two different schools. And I thought, I'm sort of in the middle. When I bring the merry pranksters and, the, and, and, and these revolutionaries together with these psychedelic scientists. And so we had an epic, epic conference. Um, so these conferences then continued, the psychoactivity conferences in Amsterdam. Um, and these conferences, in a sense, still continue to this day. But Terrence McKenna and Andrew Weil, Gary Menser, Stephen Pollock, Jonathan Ott and myself were the primary characters in the 1970s uh, that were highly active, and Dennis McKenna, of course, as well. So numerous little field guides came out. My favorite is hallucinogenic, uh, uh, the Golden Guide to Hallucinogenic Plants that had a one press run, uh, and extraordinary story behind that. Um, so in a number of numerous other books, the one on the far left down below is Dennis and Terrence's book, which is by far the most popular book. That was the book that really pierced the envelope and revolutionized um, the idea that you could grow psilocybin mushrooms in your closet. And so I call it the Psilocybe Cubensis Scholarship Fund because so many students grew psilocybes in, in their dormitories. Um, and then, you know, just small quantities, but enough to to be part of this uh, cultural revolution. And then there's four of my books on the right. So now Mark Hayden first showed me the slide and I was blown away. So with Mark's cooperation, we kind of revamped it. But these are the current uh, academic institutions that are doing clinical studies on psilocybin and psychedelics. So very impressive, Harvard, Stanford, you know, Imperial College in England, Johns Hopkins, many of you know this, the North, American academic centers involved specifically in psilocybin research uh, that Dr. Pamela and Crisco and I put together and more universities and then the European academic centers. So this is really important that these institutions have approved clinical studies of psilocybin going through uh, the IRB boards, institutional review, review boards, uh, determining that this research was important uh, it's highly li high likelihood of success or a good likelihood of success. 
and the substances were safe. Um, so in the United States, the FDA has approved these because psilocybin has been determined to be one of the most uh, non-toxic drugs uh, ever studied. Uh, this is from, from Dr. Nutt here, who published this in 2010, showing the abuse potential according to eight factors. And mushrooms are basically in the far extreme as being not uh, uh, problematic, not only harm to the user, but harm to the people in the immediate uh, surrounding uh, community. That being said, I do know of several cases, people taking magic mushrooms and freaking out. Um, but one also has to realize that some of these people may have had pre-existing conditions. They were not the right people to be taking these. They didn't have the supervision. They didn't have the constructs in place. Uh, they didn't have the set and setting uh, controlled. And so we're always going to find outliers, you know, um, to any of these statements that I'm making here. So for the species that I published, Azure Essence, Linaformis variety Americana, Sana Fibulosa, and one I named after Dr. Andrew Weil, Psilocybe Wileyi. So Psilocybe cubensis is the premier, most cultivated psilocybe mushrooms in the world. And so I'm going to show you a few meta studies here. These are quite extraordinary. Um, Zach Walsh, with whom we're associated intimately now, is a co-author of this study, one of the co-authors. But this is 480,000 people. They're surveyed, basically prisoners, by D DSHS. Um, and the association with psilocybin use uh, correlated with a 27% decreased odds of past larceny and theft, 22% decreased odds of property crime, 18% decreased odds for a violent crime. Now, very quickly, people will say association is not causation. Well, keep this in mind. It can be, especially when you start compounding all these meta studies and there is a common theme. It turns out that psychedelic use and intimate partner-to-partner -partner violence also showed that if your partner, especially men, had had one psychedelic experience, there was a statistically significant reduction in partner-to-partner -partner violence. Now that's extraordinary. So then there's also increased nature relatedness, and decreased authoritarian political views after psilocybin treatment for treatment resistant depression. So people are more engaged in the ecosystem. They see the context of their, of their life in terms of a healthy environment. Um, and they also are not as attracted to authoritarianism uh, and they have more empathy uh, to other individuals. So there's a pro-environmental behavior. Again, yet another study. Look at the po this population, 1,487 uh, people in, in this meta-study. So psilocybin mushroom use, I think, reduces criminality. These meta-studies uh, are not disconnected. I think there's a commonality here of meaning that strongly points to this. It helps break addictive behavior. There are many studies now ongoing and several that have been published showing that psilocybin uh, treatment can help addicts uh, recover and, and be able to break their addictive behavior. Overcoming fear, PTSD, and, and enhances empathy and kindness. And also courage. This is something that I think is really interesting because the conditioned fear response, when you overcome that, and I've had a few examples in my life. I have one shameful uh, experience where I did not stand up for my brother John um, when he was being attacked by a street gang. Uh, and I cowered in fear. That was my moment of shame. And I'm happy to say that I come back from that. And, uh, and I you know, step up to the plate when it's time to, for one to be courageous uh, to protect other people who are being abused. And I think that's an important thing for us to overcome our fear so we can be courageous at the right time to prevent people from physical harm. And we have evidence of increasing neurogenesis and I think to be determined, but I think psilocybin mushrooms increase intelligence. I think these are Einstein mushrooms. I truly believe this. These are leadership skills that lead to better citizenship. So the return to society and reducing criminality 
think of the implications. Because if your family can be healed from a addictive behavior or abuse, and you and you're more compassionate and supportive of your family, then it's not only your family, but your neighbors. You don't have you're not hostile to your neighbors. Well, it's not your neighbors, it's your neighborhood, it's your village, it's your city, it's your state, it's your country, it's the planet. So I think there's enormous implications for, for planetary healing. So it has been proposed that psilocybin be, be reduced to Schedule 4. Right now, Schedule 1 means there's highly uh, no medical use, high propensity for addiction. It's totally miscategorized as psilocybin in that, in that schedule. So Johns Hopkins research has proposed that it really qualifies for Schedule 4. So psilocybin increases uh, neurogenesis in the hippocampus and the extinction of the trace fear conditioning. And there is a, an extraordinary uh, experiment with mice, which were put into a cage. They were, and the floor was electrified um, and it was a tone. And then the floor, the floor became electrified 40 seconds later. So very quickly, like Pavlov's dog, they quickly associated the tone with a shock. And upon then, acclimating them to this, whenever they heard the tone, they would cower in fear. Well, when they dosed them then with psilocybin mushrooms, uh, in 10 rotations, they were able to dissociate, they weren't shocked anymore, uh, the tone. And so after 10 times, then they heard the tone, they wouldn't cower in fear. What's interesting though, is that the microdose, they only took two rotations, not the high dose, the low dose. So when one tenth as much of psilocybin were given to these mice, they dissociated the uh, fear condition response and were able to then not be fearful uh, of the tone. So that's interesting to me is dissociation of fear can occur with a lower dose. Now this may be translational medicine. This is something that needs to be tested, but I think it's worthy of paying attention to. So lion's mane mushrooms are well documented with several clinical studies as um, increasing, um, um, improving mood uh, as an antidepressive. Uh, also, they have neurogenic properties. Um, and they've been used in several clinical studies uh, for pre-Alzheimer's and mild cognitive uh, impairment. And they had significantly increased uh, cognitive uh, scores uh, compared to the placebo group at 8, 12, and 16 weeks. Very interestingly, upon not taking the lion's mane, it's the mycelium, not the mushrooms. This is really, really interesting to me, is the mycelium is giving this benefit, but not the mushrooms, that the when they stop taking, these patients stop taking the mushrooms, they then begin to revert into the cognitive decline slope uh, that was characteristic of them uh, prior to uh, taking these lion mane mushrooms, mycelium, every day. So it turns out that these lion mane uh, mushroom mycelium contain compounds called aranacines, um, and they, they, uh, the benefits uh, persisted in this study, a uh, recent clinical study out of, I think, uh, Taiwan, and this was o over about 49 weeks for an entire year. So th there's about four um, clinical studies currently that have been published uh, on lion's mane mushrooms showing these benefits. And the benefits are really interesting because it causes, and it shows the remyelination. Uh, demyelination is associated with neuropathies associated with age, and the amyloid plaque formation is characteristic of Alzheimer's patients. And resection, when in this case of mice, when they induce amyloid plaque formation and neurodegeneration with a toxic polypeptide uh, that mimics uh, the what is seen in Alzheimer's patients' brains, they were able then, these fully engulfed uh, uh, neurodegenerative mice that had these characteristic amyloid plaques and demyelination, upon feeding the my mice a diet of lion's mane mushroom mycelium over se several weeks, when they took a representative population and resect them, basically dissect them post-mortem, they were able to see significant uh, remyelination and removal of the amyloid plaques. So this is, you know, um, histologically, you know, a proof of what is to be also be seen uh, behaviorally. 
So we can see there's actually a change that's going on neurologically. So we started doing some experiments um, and using this laboratory in France, NeuroFit, uh, comparing uh, BDNFs, which is brain-derived nerve growth factors. This is the gold standard for neurogenesis versus the control. And we have the uh, lion's mane mycelium grown uh, extracts thereof versus these very same mushrooms that came from the mycelium. Um, so we found an increase in about 8%, whereas the mushroom fruit bodies actually slowed uh, neurogenesis uh, below the control. Well, obviously that's not too exciting, um, but the mycelium did improve significantly. So we started doing some other experiments with psilocybin analogs. I do not have a, a DEA license presently. The psilocybin analogs we're using was Bayosystin, Norbayosystin, and Norcilicin. These are legal. Uh, they're not Schedule One substances. But we started comparing the BNFs, and um, in this case, the 42% increase on, on the, the positive control. Lion's mane, in this case, went from 8% to, to 11%. And the analogs, interestingly, did quite well, 19% and 29% between uh, Bayosystem and Norbayosystem. Norcilicin was not, was marginally better at 5%. But then something else happened that was very exciting. When we repeated this, and we've done this now six, seven times, I think we're on our eighth rotation of these experiments. So we're building this huge data set of repetitive uh, confirmatory results. So when you look at the lion's mane this time, it's, it's about 15%. Remember, it was 8 to 11, now it's 15, within that range. And then the norcilicin was only 7%. Last time it was 5% increase in neurite outgrowth. Well, the predicted theoretical additive effect, would you add 114.8, 107.7, and you get 122.5. So that's a predicted theoretical uh, additive effect. We didn't see that. We saw synergism. It went uh, up to 36%. Um, so we have now repeated this. We're getting consistently the same results of what we call the entourage effect, the synergism between lion's mane and mycelium and the psilocybin analogs. So we're working with Harvard Medical School now with Rudy Tanzi. He's the director of the Alzheimer's Clinic there. Uh, we have found potent neuro anti-inflammatory effects uh, in vitro um, of not only lion's mane, uh, but also the psilocybin analogs. And so this is really exciting to us because I think it's the first research showing that these psilocybin an analogs have anti-neuroinflammatory properties, which also could be significant in being able to prevent dementia, Alzheimer's, and increasing neurogenesis and intelligence, as well as mood. So I came up with this formula, um, which is the commonly known as a stamate stack of psilocybin and, and psilocybin mushrooms. And estimating that uh, psilocybin mushrooms dried at 1%, it would be equivalent to about one milligram of psilocybin in pure form. So one milligram is, is a subsensorian dose. Uh, 10 milligrams is definitely a, a, a liftoff dose. You know, 30 milligrams, you're on, you're on the heroic journey. 50 milligrams is, you know, Terrence would, would, uh, would clearly enjoy it and espouse. Um, but the idea is to stack uh, with psilocybin mushrooms equivalent to about one-tenth of a gram of psilocybin cubensis with uh, lion's mane and then with niacin, nicotinic acid, vitamin B3. Now, it's really important you understand that you know, we already showed the evidence of why lion's mane uh, and psilocybin mushrooms uh, can have this entourage effect. And But niacin offers some unique additive benefits and properties that I think will make this scalable and hopefully uh, uh, available as an over-the-counter medicine in the future. Niacin is a vasodilator. That's important. So you can get more of these neurogenic benefits from psilocybin and the aranaceans from the lion's mane um, through your vascular system. Um, it also turns out that it's essential for neurological health. The reference down below shows the absence of niacin in your diet, niacin deficiency causes neurodegeneration. So now you have vasodilation, we know that if you don't have niacin, you have neurodegeneration. Moreover, it causes this flushing reaction. And many of you know this, you take vitamin B3, and you know, take 500 to uh, you know, a gram or two, 
Uh, you get a really rapid, uh, intense flushing reaction. You turn red, you itch all over. And so I thought, well, wait, it's interesting because if you this sold microdoses, and you have 100 pills in a jar, what's going to prevent someone from taking a microdose and saying, well, I'll take make it into a macrodose. I'll eat 20 or 40 of those. Well, if you stacked it with niacin at uh, 50 to 100 milligrams, if they would take, you know, 20 capsules, for instance, that could be two grams of niacin. And I assure you, it is a very unpleasant experience. So it becomes sort of the anti-abuse uh, to prevent uh, abuse of this, with the idea that microdosing could be very beneficial uh, for the masses without causing intoxication. Without um, And my, microdosing, by definition, means you don't feel it. Uh, you don't, you're not getting high. So I suggest that less than one-tenth of a gram is substensorium. Um, James Fadiman recommends a higher amount, but I don't agree with him on that. He's up to four-tenths of a gram. I definitely feel it um, at those higher levels. So the idea is you do want to have no intoxicating effects. And I think that'll be much more, you know, um, friendly to, as an idea to the FDA or to any other regulatory bodies in Canada, uh, knowing that you're not actually get, uh, in, ingesting an intoxicant. You're doing it something at a, at a microdose level. So the James Fadiman protocol, he has one day on, uh, two days off, one day on, repeat. Mine was one to, one to four days on, five to seven days off. So, and he's recommending microdosing starting at 0.4 grams or less. I think that's way too high from my experience. Uh, 0.1 uh, grams or less is what I think is a lot safer range. But we're just navigating through this. You know, the data will determine uh, the best frequency, the best combinations, et cetera. So let, let the data, um, you know, prevail. So I want to bring up this app that uh, Dr. Pram Crisco and I have been advising, Ismael and Kalen, um, of Quantified uh, Citizen. And it's the largest microdosing study in the world. It's available at microdose.me for um, Apple devices. And basically, it's gone through um, a review to make the ethics review. It asks you what you've been doing. Have you been stacking it with chocolate, with lion's mane? How much have you been taking? Um, and was a pre-weighted uh, weighted pill. Um, again, chocolate still being used today from the Aztec times uh, to currently uh, as an admixture, combining the two. It's got a memory test. It's got hearing. It's a uh, vision. And it's also have a, a tap test, um, how quickly you can tap your fingers, you know, um, and be able to pre-Parkinsonism uh, testing protocol oftentimes used. So this has now been extraordinary because we I popularized this on Joe Rogan. And um, so there's three different categories that we selected for low dose, medium dose, and high dose. Again, that you know conforms uh, pretty much to the the you know what we've been talking about with James Fadiman and my mind as well. Again, high dose I think is, is too high, less than one tenth of a gram. So this is a preliminary data I'm going to show you. It's actually we don't have 3,486 psilocybin users. There's over 4,000 uh, that, that, uh, that signed up for this app and started recording their metrics. What's interesting, too, we had almost uh, more than just about the same balance, uh, a little more than 4,000 non microdosers, people not using psilocybin. So it's a very interesting parity between the microdosing group and people not microdosing who just wanted to measure their cognitive, you know, metrics to see, as we all know, we decline in age. And so it was really interesting. There was a big cohort of uh, non microdosers that were involved. So we have a paper that's being submitted uh, in the next week or two uh, with much of this data. So this is extraordinary here. In this subset, non microdosers, 76 people, microdosers, 143. And looking at the depression over a one-month period, so the non-microdoser, the baseline is basically unchanged, and the microdoser is extraordinary uh, uh, significance. Uh, the p-value is less than 0 0.001. On the DAS scale, it showed a, 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 a very strong benefits. On the anxiety, so depression and anxiety can go hand in hand. On the anxiety scale, also showed significant benefit. 
uh, with those that were microdosing. This one on mood, positive mood, is the Panas scale uh, was also extraordinarily significant. So of using psilocybin mushrooms in microdosing. Now think of the confounders here. This is to me is it really where if you disambiguate this, it's a lot more significant, I think logically than what we're showing here right now, because you have people taking different amounts of the psilocybin mushrooms, you know the less than one tenth of a gram, the the people higher than that. Um, you have receptivity factors. Some people are non-responders. Um, you have variability in the potency of the mushrooms that are being consumed. Uh, some of these mushrooms that could be a year, two years old, some could be fresh, some could be the stems mostly, the other caps, variability between strains, influence of the substrate, psilocybin mushroom grown on straw or weaker than psilocybin mushrooms grown on grain. Um, so you have all those confounders and yet you have such significance. This should give pause to anyone thinking that a pure pharmaceutical is better than a natural product. Any person, any scientist see a p-value of that significance with a natural product, and they're looking at it, making an investment in a pharmaceutical company, espousing a pure crystalline single molecule versus the natural form. Face it, folks, 99% of the people are going to use the natural form. So I think as we disambiguate this and the data sets become more robust and we have better controls and better studies, this is a platform for a leap off in knowledge that can create a paradigm shift across the planet with a natural substance. So I do have a precaution and Dr. Pam Crisco, I wanna give you credit for helping me put this together. It's a little bit dense here, but for those physicians out there are maybe well aware of this, there's a potential of psilocybin mushrooms harming heart valve from repetitive use. That's called the, the vivular heart disease. It's been a concern because of the 5-HT2B receptor. And it comes from a drug of, that's an aerobic derivative, actually, uh, called cabaroline and fenfen. Many of you know that because it was, it was a diet uh, drug that was taken off the market because it was causing uh, this heart valve problem. Well, if you dig into the literature and you look at these drugs, they're being used repetitively over a long periods of time. And they have half-lives that are really long, 65 and 20 hours are occupying that receptor. So whereas psilocybin, the, the half-life and the binding life is only two and a half to three hours. So out, 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 out of an abundance of caution, it's, it's, it's intellectually responsible for me to bring this to your attention but let's keep it also in context. Macrodosing with psilocybin mushrooms is only occasional at high doses. You know, I consume these sacraments uh, once or twice a year. Uh, microdosing, yes, you can be doing those more often, but you're taking about such a small amount. And I, you know, put it out there, if you're not feeling lift off, how much binding are you having at the 5H2A receptor? Uh, by definition, those receptors are, uh, are uh, if you have an agonist that's binding with them, you're going to feel it. So it's, you know, it's, it's a numbers game here. But I think that this is a concern. Uh, is it a concern without practical significance or is it a concern with practical significance? An echocardiogram could easily detect whether there's a heart valve issue. We need more data. This is relatively easy to determine. So I asked all scientists out there and researchers please start employing echocardiograms uh, to see if this concern is meritable uh, or is it just academically uh, interesting, um, but it's a fact without significance. Um, so, or, so that's important that I mentioned that. So I wanna just come to the conclusion here in the next few slides. What's the advantage of psilocybin mushrooms versus pharmaceutically grade psilocybin psilocin? Well, psilocybin mushrooms are widely available you know, they're super inexpensive. Um, you can grow all that mushrooms that cost of portobellos. It's not controlled by the pharmaceutical industry. They can be grown at home, well-established long cultural use, and long history of safety. And people like to know that they're celebrating and in, in ceremony, 
with their ancestors that goes back tens of thousands of years. They're in a continuum of people sharing this joint experience together that crosses cultures, crosses time. The, the entourage effect benefit that I've described already, the psilocybin analogs, and the their, the appeal of the natural form. Some people would rather take a natural you know, substance than taking a pure pharmaceutical. The disadvantages of the pure pharmaceutical is it's not widely available yet. Um, it's controlled by pharmaceutical companies. Some people think that's a big, a big problem. They're trying to control your consciousness or your access to improving your consciousness. Affordability to, to be determined. And the funding investors is primarily driven by profit. You know, there is a, it's important to mention that many people investing in stocks have a Machiavellian approach to trying to maximize profit uh, at every opportunity. And so they are profit driven. Uh, they are not driven uh, with the idea of benefiting the commons. They're trying to benefit their own personal bank account. Well, there are disadvantages to psilocybin mushrooms. Some of the disadvantages, variability in psilocybin content, contamination rate due to molds, no CGMP standards yet, good manufacturing practices, no accountability yet, lack of confidence for, uh, for new wary customers. Uh, I know several people, they would rather get it from a pharmaceutical company because they know it's pure and it's standardized and the FDA has approved it. But also a basic disadvantage is an important one to me is there's no tax revenue from the sale of psilocybin mushrooms in the underground. They're using our roads, they're using the post office, they use the fire department, they're, you know, all these social benefits from the commons and they're pocketing the money entirely for their own profits. I think that's a problem. So the advantages then for the, the pharmaceutical industry is they do have those controls. The content is guaranteed, impurities are minimized. Uh, there is accountability. If you have adverse reactions, you know where to go to and you have confidence because it's a measured amount and there are tax revenues. So, you know, it's hard to paint the canvas with one brush. It's a spectrum here. And we have to take into context the advantages and disadvantages of each modality. The other thing that's really important for me to mention is that the cell side mushrooms change in a matter of four to five hours. They'll go from a stage that you see on the left there or in the center photograph to the ones in the background. The flesh thins, becomes gills, the gills produce spores. Many people are allergic to spores, especially asthmatic children. 100% of asthmatic children are allergic to psilocybin events of spores versus 14% of the mycelium. So it's, when you look at the mushrooms dried on the lower left versus the mushrooms on the lower right is poor quality, lots of gills, lots of spores, thin flesh. The mushrooms don't have a good immune system so when they're aged, they're susceptible to molds and bacteria. The mushrooms on the left are young. The gills have not matured. The spores have not matured. The flesh is thick and the mushrooms are healthier and they're more resistant uh, to pathogens. So bear in mind when you're eating a mushroom that's really old, you're eating a microbiome <laughs> of all sorts of other uh, would-be contaminants. Um, the, uh, opportunistically or otherwise are, are resident on the mushrooms you're consuming. So there is a pathway with the FDA for botanical drug development. So this is my concept of people medicine versus profit medicine. I think psilocybin mushrooms are natural form standardized to identifiable markers. And once you standardize psilocybin mushrooms, like a big batch of them, you can d dilute. If there's variability, you can mix the entire batch up uh, dilute it to a standardized dose. It's much easier to dilute to a standardized dose than it is to concentrate uh, versus profit medicine, which is mo mostly, as many of you know, uh, several new pharmas have started up on psilocybin. So the, I want to take this a little further now. I want to push to the envelope of your, of your imagination. We already show, you know, good evidence of memory, cognition, coordination, visual acuity, hearing, immunity, immunity. Well, that's interesting. There's lots of these diseases are immunologically impacted. And I suggest to you that there's immunity improvement. So the idea here is that depression is a dysfunction of the immune system and vice versa. Published in the, in the Lancet as well, it's bi-directional. So if you are depressed, literally, emotionally, 
your immune system is depressed. If you're happier, you don't have anxiety, you're in a better mood, your, your immune system is upregulated to a higher state of readiness. Well, think of the implications then. So microdosing with psilocybin improves depression. Immunity improves with improved mood. Psilocybin could be a broadly applicable adjunct therapy to conventional medicine. If patients were in a better mood and not as anxious going into surgery, not as depressed about their state of their health, optimistically engages with a physician and adopts their recommendations uh, to be put into practice, you'd have better compliance. And I suggest to you this is a coefficient multiplier which will enhance the outcomes of conventional medicine. Health and disease, I see as a multifactorial equation where you have multiple uh, factors multiplied together, the end result spells increased health or you know, more disease. And I think it's, it's that significant potentially. So the newest data we have right now is the neuroanti-inflammatory uh, expression of gene sequences elicited by the uh, psilocybin analogs. So it, the entourage effect is much greater than just neurogenesis. We are seeing the neuroanti-inflammatory properties as being also um, a significant added advantage. So I have mushroomreferences.com. I populate as non-branded just for scientists and physicians. Several hundred pages long now uh, with the abstracts, some of the most significant references on lion's mane clinical studies, turkey tail, you know, all the psilocybin research I've been able to, to find that's clinically relevant is up there. My personal website is paulsamus.com. I want to thank MAPS in Canada. Thank you, Mark Hayden. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you, Beth, in the background. And I'll be glad to take some questions. All right. Thank you so much, Paul. So it looks like we have about 19 questions here. So we'll get a few of them in at least. Uh, so let's start uh, with the one that has the most votes from our viewers today. And this is from Andrew. And Andrew asks, do you believe there are any pharmacological differences between psilocybin containing fungi and synthetic analogs or prodrugs such as 4-ACO-DMT or 4-HO-DET? And if you click on the ask a question, you can read it there as well. Well, that's a great question. And when I don't know, I will tell you I don't know. And um, I don't know. I really, and that's a really good question. I would like to see, you know, parallel, uh, you know, testing protocols, uh, comparing them. Uh, so I, I applaud the question, but, you know, you definitely are uh, thinking um, along critical lines uh, of comparisons. And I, I think that's an important logic uh, exercise to continue. Uh, but I don't know the answer to that question. So. All right. Uh, we have one here, and this is from a different Andrew, Andrew McMillan. He says, how can I get my college university talking about this topic? Well, I think that contacting MAPS you know, is good. Um, Mark Hayden and, and MAPS US and MAPS Canada. Just showing the number of universities that are, have approved these clinical studies. I gave a, a, a talk um, at Singularity and in, in, in Stanford Medical School, and um, they and 700, 800 doctors in the audience, and the uh, the sponsors know me really well. They're good friends of mine, and um, and they announced that Paul's going to talk about magic mushrooms, and there was several doctors was next to my my friend who's a doctor who started snickering in the audience. Um, and they look like deer in headlights when their slides went up showing all the universities. And many of the other researchers on that subject at Stanford uh, were in the audience. And when you suddenly realize that you're behind the times and this is the new wave of science that is fact-based, that is approved by multiple universities in the FDA, um, you, who are you going to challenge? A course of a thousand scientists 
that have already vetted this as being significant? Or are you going to be the lone wolf out there looking like an idiot uh, because you're behind the times and you're not educated enough? The problem about mushrooms is they get a knee-jerk reaction from the ignorant. When people are ignorant about them, you know, you, you met, many of us have experienced this. You mentioned mushrooms, you'll get a, a nervous laugh and somebody will make a dumb joke of being kept in the dark, you know, or they'll tell you their mushroom joke. And it's just, it's just so, it, it's so beneath uh, the academic level uh, of, of intellectualism that, that this subject deserves. It's mm -hmm. time for us all to be adults here. And when I see these, there's this well-known physician at TED, and he scoffed uh, at the idea, but he uses authority as a physician to downplay the science in this subject, even though he's never published on the subject, he's not knowledgeable of the subject. So power is intoxicating, and physicians and all experts become intoxicated by their sense of power, and they speak outside their, their skill sets. And I think we do need to call them out on it. Just simply say, sir, that's very interesting you have that opinion. Can I see the papers that you published on this subject? And they, well, I haven't published. Uh, can you name the papers you've read on this subject? Uh, 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 uh. You know, it's time for us to take them to the mat, you know? And I, I believe in respecting authority that's legitimate. But it's time for us to not let the bullies in academia bully us into submission because we're too humble and quiet to be able to want to have the courage to stand up to speak the truth. So let's stay in, in a fact-based reality. Let's we'll stay with science. If people espouse an opinion um, that you know is wrong, you know, don't be timid, stand up. You got a whole, you got generations. You have tens of thousands of people who are there, you know, spiritually behind you. You know, they got your back. So I just realized that it's time for us to take back the narrative, you know, and let science rule the day. Uh, anyhow. Thank you, Paul. That That's so, so powerful words there. Absolutely. Um, definitely needed to be said. So thank you for saying that. Uh, we have a question here from Kara, and I know you already covered this, but uh, perhaps you want to elaborate a little bit. How might psilocybin mushrooms help with the possible slowing down or reversal of neurode neurodegenerative diseases, <laughs> excuse me there, uh, like multiple sclerosis? Yeah, I'm not a medical doctor, so I can't speak about MS, uh, but my, my partner is a medical doctor. And um, they, uh, we know of two studies in Canada uh, that she's, she's involved with designing, one in particular with, al with Alzheimer's. Uh, in Eastern Canada that we hope to have the clinical studies with the psilocybin uh, up and running here in 2021. So again, let, let's, let's see what, uh, what these studies show. This is what's so exciting is everyone, all these other scientists are now jumping on the bandwagon. When, when Harvard you know, started getting involved and Stanford started getting involved and UCLA was involved and Johns Hopkins led the charge. And it's like the Johns Hopkins was, was the lead ship in this flotilla of scientists and everyone else is like jumping on board because now they're seeing that this is really good science and it's paradigm shifting because it's you know the the problem with psilocybin mushrooms is that they seem like a panacea well the advantage of psilocybin mushrooms is they seem like they're a panacea so they have you know your neurology your neurological health is so functional to who you are and your symptoms of disease, PTSD, depression, anxiety, dementia. These are our symptoms of a neurological system that's being challenged. These are nutrients for your neurons that are bolstering your neurological foundation. And the ramifications of that is elaborated in all these other areas. So we'll, we'll see what the science shows on that work. And Johns Hopkins has an Alzheimer's clinical study with psilocybin ongoing right now as well. Perfect, thank you. Uh, one from Jamie here. Thank you, Paul, for speaking today. In your opinion, how does psilocybin mushrooms heal human beings from our past traumas? How can psilocybin mushrooms help us heal from our past trauma? 
Mm-hmm. Well, I I can sp- speak not as a medical um, expert because I'm not a medical expert. I'm a mycologist that has this intersection with medicine. But what I, from the reading I've done, specifically with the research at Johns Hopkins, um, it seems to be a big factor is overlaying the psilocybin therapeutical session where you are dealing with past trauma and you have this therapeutic breakthrough with a great therapist, you know, you're able to go back into your childhood, into whatever instance, instances of abuse, you know, it could be one or many, you're able to then have a positive outcome from the first time dealing with that experience. Oftentimes people say it was a horrible experience, but I made, it was much bigger than it needed to be when they reconciled it. And then re-remembering the experience in the John Hopkins studies showed the act of re-remembering, not the trauma, but the resolution of the trauma during the psilocybin experience overlaid and became the resonant predominant memory was not of the feeling of trauma, but the feeling of their remembering that they reconciled through the psilocybin. So it seems to retrain the memory pathways so it prioritizes your therapeutic resolution from the experience as opposed to the ex- experience that caused the trauma to begin with. You know, and your, your maybe your fresher memories, you know, come into play. But I think that's really extraordinary. It's just, is that you can come to a point that you say, yeah, I dealt with that. And, and the thing is that I want everyone to know, this is so important to me. The beauty of psilocybin mushrooms is it teaches you to love yourself. When you love yourself and you forgive yourself, you can then forgive others and you can love others. None of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. Some of us are truly assholes, you know, but even even they, they need healing. And what I see this is this, this extension of, of um, goodness that emanates out like a pebble into a pond. And uh, when you s- suddenly, and there's so many examples of this, and many, many therapists here already know this, is that they become evangelical about their excitement for telling others that I was a really bad person. I'm sorry. You are right. I, I want to make amends. You know, I'm going to walk my talk. Actions are louder than words. You know, I am going to be the person I always wanted to be. You know, and and move forward. So I think that's what these mushrooms do. Mm-hmm. Thank you. So powerful. We have a question here from Mexico. From excuse me if I pronounce this wrong, Arid Aridian. Um, do you have any experience with psilocybin and attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? Outside of my skill set, I would ask a qualified medical practitioner. Um, I, I do know this subject has come up uh, multiple times. I've been witnesses to physicians talking about this subject, you know, as a modality that they would like mushrooms to address, but outside my skill set. Okay, perfect. And we have one here from Maria Jose. I've heard lion's mane is also a medicine for healing depression. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. There is a clinical study. If you go to mushroomreferences.com, you can look up a clinical study out of Japan with postmenopausal women uh, that benefited from taking lion's mane mushroom and found that it to be a strong antidepressive in its properties. So that study is has been published. Small clinical study, but significant benefits. Perfect. Thank you. And then we have one from Noah that asks about psilocybin mushrooms. Can they cause schizophrenia? Well, can psilocybin mushrooms cause schizophrenia? I think if people are schizophrenic and they take psilocybin mushrooms, they may still have schizophrenia. So again, that's outside my my domain, my expertise. I would ask that you ask a qualified medical practitioner 
Uh, but that qualified medical practitioner, I would also ask them if they have an opinion, what is the basis of their opinion? Please give me a peer reviewed scientific article substantiating your opinion and not something from the 1960s during the war on drugs and the Nixon, you know, era. Show us something uh, current because so much of that, so much of the science was politicized. This is what very few and younger people, I'm going to stand up for us elders, quote unquote. You have it so much easier. The war on drugs was a serious war. It was a racist war. They went out after the jazz community in New Orleans because they were smoking pot. So they, they weaponized cannabis. And they went after the environmentalists. They went after the war resistors. They went after the African-American community. They went after the civil rights community. The war on drugs was weaponized as class warfare in order to subjugate people's rights. And there was a freedom of consciousness and a freedom of civil rights movement that the authoritarian Nixon, you know, like, you know, people were afraid. They were, we were shaking the foundation of society. Um, and now it's our multi-ethnicity that's our strength. It's our biodiversity that's our strength. And it's now it's time for us to look towards 2021 with a, a brighter view of the future. Perfect. Thank you, Paul. I have a question here from Nurse Kelly, and she asks, have you experienced any recent pushback criticism that raises legitimate concerns, for example, in relation to psilocybin from the psychiatric medicine community? Yeah, there has been pushback with uh, Initiative 109, uh, which uh, legalized uh, psilocybin mushrooms uh, in Oregon for therapeutic use. And I do know that the uh, one in psychiatric association uh, was concerned that there would be an uh, insufficiently trained therapists that would be using a powerful drug. So yeah, there is a pushback, uh, yeah. but I think that pushback is good. I think it's really important that we get it right. And so I think opposition um, is important. So we become more disciplined and more professional uh, and we take the, we create the maximum benefit. These are powerful medicines. And um, those of you who know me, uh, the one of the words I just can't handle, do not like is the word shroom. When anyone says shrooms to me, it, to me, it's biological racism against a mushroom, you know, it's uh, because it puts into a category of a party drug, you know, and, and making fun of it. These are serious sacraments. What it's important that psilocy uh, mushrooms had their form long before we had ours. These are ancient organisms. You know, these mushrooms had their forms a hundred million years ago, many of them. And we have our forms as homo sapiens the past 500,000 to 2 million years ago. You know, homo erectus going back further, which is a few tens of millions of years old. These are hundreds of millions of years old. These are ancient organisms. So respect your elders. Thank you. That actually leads into uh, the next question. We'll have time for about one or two more questions here. Vice.com published an article on December 10th questioning how often psychedelics were actually used in ancient cultures. Do you think the portrayal of ancient use of psychedelics has been exaggerated in recent literature? If so, does it damage the credibility of the current Renaissance? That's a really good question. And I have an opinion on that, but I respect other opinions, people's opinion on that. I would think that the use of psychedelic medicines has probably been underreported. I admit my prejudice uh, on this, but these are profound, profound sacraments and they have life changing. In almost every indigenous culture, there is a rite of passage from a child to an adult mm -hmm. typically at puberty, puberty or just afterwards, where the child becomes adopted into a new form as a young adult. And so many indigenous cultures have a ritual for that. And those of us of European backgrounds, in some ways, yeah, we, we were the invaders to other cultures. We were also displaced. 
uh, many of the migrations of Europeans were to escape religious persecution. And then you end up losing the structures of your you know, indigenous wisdom by being displaced and not carrying those rituals with you. So this is, I think, the use of these sacraments is so core to the indigenous cultures that I'm familiar with it's a central tenant of them, of those cultures. It's not something that someone on the fringe in the culture is using. No, it's a central pedestal, uh, mm -hmm. in the spirituality of the indigenous peoples that, that have welcomed me into, into their world. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Well, we're running at time here and uh, we have a special event to hop into with you in about three minutes. So I'm just wondering if you have any final words here to say to the viewers today. Well, I think the, the words I want to reemphasize is let's all be adults. Let's all be mature about this. Let's all be very careful. When you see somebody going astray, you know, reach out to them with kindness and courage and empathy and try to bring them back you know, to understand that we all have this uh, in, in our commons together. You know, we, need to, we need to heal this planet. And we need as many uh, people to step, step up to the plate right now. And I think these mushrooms are Einstein mushrooms. I think they increase intelligence. And the loss of the encyclopedic knowledge of elders is a loss to the commons, is loss to the body intellect. And if we can inspire young people and preserve the knowledge we have, but not only that, but become more creative, to cross collaborate, to come up with the ideas and solutions that we need to, to steer this planet and this biosphere into a healthier future. I think all of us can join together knowing that we're doing our part. So I just ask everyone to try to do their part. And um, so that's all I wanna say. Well, thank you so much, Paul. We always appreciate having you here at MAPS Canada and on the Examining the Psychedelic Renaissance webinar series. And um, a few of us are going to hop into a private chat with you in about a few minutes here on Zoom. Okay. So I wanted to say thank you again for being here and sharing your wisdom with us. We're always happy to have you back and we're happy to have you as a, a supporter. So thank you so much for being here with us today. Okay, thank you, Shan. Thank you, Mark Hayden, wherever you are. All right, take care. Thank you, and we'll see you soon in the Zoom room. All right. So just to close up the uh, webinar today, I would like to say thank you again to our speaker, Paul Stamets. Thank you to all of our sponsors for the whole webinar series. If you haven't checked out the Perks page yet, make sure and do so. And the link will be in the chat in just a moment here. And uh, you can also check out Paul's website. We'll post that in the chat as well. A special thank you to all of our speakers who've shown up to share their expertise in all of the episodes of season one and season two. Thank you to all of our volunteers, Beth, who does our tech, and Michael M, who is on tech as well, and then Kenny for season one, and many other volunteers behind the scenes that have helped to make this webinar a success. And thank you to you all for being here to support this series, these speakers, this important research. Again, we'd love your feedback. So please feel free to fill out the survey, which will be posted in the chat as well. And those of you attending the special post webinar session with Paul, we'll take a couple of minutes here, but the Zoom room is going to be open shortly. So please hop on and we're gonna start in about one to two minutes there. So up and coming, just a reminder that all episodes are recorded. So if you have some time over the holidays and you want to go re-watch all of the episodes, you can just log back into your Crowdcast account and do so. Thank you again to Paul Stamets for his amazing talk today and sharing that wisdom. Thank you again for attending the episode today as well as the whole series. Don't forget to be kind and thank you for watching Examining the Psychedelic Renaissance season two. Bye for now.